Magic Conj, will I ever get to meet Tom Kenny? Maybe someday. Oh, so you're saying there's a chance. Okay, okay. Should I tell fans of the show how they can support us? Yes. Goofy Goobers, supporting the show is shockingly easier than catching a blue jellyfish. Right from our Anchor page, anchor.fm slash spongepod, you can find links to all of our social media and a support button if you happen to have a few extra clams. Also follow us on twitch.tv slash spongebobpodcast, where it's not only the official home to our sister show, Video Bob Game Pants, it's also where I stream live drawings of various Nickelodeon characters and host the opportunity for commissions and giveaways. Lastly, the official merchandise store is now open at redbubble.com slash people slash spongepod, where various designs will be uploaded in Inspired by our show, including our official logo, which is now available on a multitude of products like t-shirts, stickers, duvet covers, and even a shower curtain. This is a podcast by a fan for fans and will always be fan driven. Any way you see fit on supporting our show is much appreciated. Thank you and enjoy. And welcome to another episode of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast. My name is Captain Eric, and we are still sailing through the first season of SpongeBob SquarePants. But we are taking a bit of a detour into the very first video game where SpongeBob was playable. Uh, I'll explain everything in a second, but first I want to plug Christian Vasquez. Who, uh, who provided that rendition of the SpongeBob theme song in 8-bit. Check out his YouTube channel, uh, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-V-A-S-Q-U-E-Z. Search that with the SpongeBob 8-bit uh, on YouTube. I was looking for a bunch. Of, I was trying to find a 16-bit version of the theme song to play, uh, and I came across that, and it just sounded so good. I enjoyed the composition so much. Uh, so thank you, Christian, for, for helping us out there. Um, every one of the Video Bob Game Pants episodes, I, I would like to include a different creator of, uh, of a the rendition of the SpongeBob theme song, whether it be uh, 8-bit or, or 16-bit or 32-bits, 64-bits, what have you. Um, so for those that don't know, and I've explained this from the very beginning, and I always will explain this just because I, I feel like it needs explaining. When I was laying out the episodes of SpongeBob SquarePants, seeing how deep, oh my God, when I get to the camping episode, I'll be that episode's deep in, and I wanted to find a streaming element. I've always wanted to stream more video games, and I wanted to find a way to incorporate SpongeBob video games because of the sheer amount of SpongeBob video games. And I came up with the thought that when there's a game released that has SpongeBob as a playable character, um, going by the date of release, I will kind of insert it in between the episodes of SpongeBob so that everything kind of fits in order, makes sense. And then I can stream the games over on Twitch or originally Mixer, stream them, stream them to completion. And then do a review on the regular podcast. So here we are in the first ever episode of that. Um, last week, on July 1st, 2020, we streamed over at twitch.tv slash SpongeBob's, uh, SpongeBob podcast. Uh, my fr my uh, best friend Alex and I streamed all three versions of Nicktoons Racing. Nicktoons Racing is the very first video game that SpongeBob was playable in as far as I can find um, now there may have been uh, and excuse me I have my coffee right now because this is much needed um, there have, may have been a uh, flash game or something released on nick.com before Nicktoons Racing where uh, um, Spongebob w was playable in but <laughs> From everything I can find, the very first video game he appeared in was Nicktoons Racing. And I have a lot of love of Nicktoons Racing, though it is not 
a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination. But if you can put yourself in the mindset of a kid at the time, like I can, um, seeing all these Nicktoons together for the first time. Now, it, it isn't the first time that there were Nicktoon crossover games. Um, a lot of them were on the PC. I know, like, 3D Movie Maker um, with a lot of the Nicktoons uh, was was a thing. And there was a few others. This is the first one I ever played with all of the Nicktoons involved. Um, and I think I knew about the arcade version Bef even though that was the latest to release in 2003, maybe I knew about the PS1 version. I didn't play any of those until years later. I played the arcade version first. The second I saw that, this big orange cabinet, SpongeBob and Arnold and Tommy and Cat Dog on the cover, Eliza Thornberry. Oh my God, what is this? It's like Mario Kart, but with Nicktoons. Um, and as a kid, you can overlook flaws. And you can overlook a lot about the game because, you know, you're just stunned that it exists in the first place. It is, uh, yes, it is like Mario Kart, but uh, Mario Kart, this is not. This is Nicktoons Racing. Um, I will give it this, though. All three versions of the game, games that we played, uh, two of which I had never played until getting ready for this this show beyond trying it out once or twice. Um, I own both of the Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, and PS1 versions of this game. Um, I do have the PC version on disc somewhere. Um, when I bought those games, though, on the handheld systems, it wasn't until I really got heavily into video game collecting, which is about... Um, the the end of the of the 2000s, you know, around 2008, 2009 is when I really started taking um, my video game collection seriously and just starting to buy up uh, games that of of uh, of properties I enjoyed, licensed games, um, the big title games for for all kinds of systems, you know, popular NES or Super Nintendo or Genesis, um, but then getting you know, Double Dare on the NES or uh, Aerial Monsters and trying to get all the Ren and Stimpy games. In the last, I will say, I got really serious with the uh, Nicktoons games, the Nickelodeon games in the last six or seven years. Um, so maybe around 2013, 2014. Uh, and I, I've worked at retro game stores um, and it's helped build this collection. But anyway, so I've owned these games, but I, I other than playing them, maybe once or twice seeing how they how they looked how they played i never really sat down and played them for a long period of time or beaten them until until this episode the uh the 3d version i have a lot of experience with in arcades and on the ps1 so we're going to begin though with the very first of the three that was released which is the um game boy color the Game Boy Color version of Nicktoons Racing is is by far the simplest out of all of them. It is, I would say, if you were to lay all of these out with a single frame of each game, it is obviously going to be the one least appealing. But by the end, I think I found a lot to like about the Game Boy Color version. Um, unlike its counterparts, it is not a tra traditional Mario Kart-esque racing game. Uh, it doesn't take place from behind the racer. The Game Boy Color version of Nicktoons Racing is more of a top-down, asymmetrical type racing game. Um, it reminded me a lot of the kind of slot car racing games, uh, the mini games of Mario Party. Um or even games like Micro Machines, it reminded me of. Um, the selection of characters was was clearly the most lacking. You had SpongeBob, you have Arnold, you have Eliza, you have the Beavers, separate, Norbert and Daggett, which, by the way, one of the most striking things about this game is they actually got the names of the Beavers wrong. So when you select Norbert, it, it's, it says Daggett and vice versa. Um, 
uh, it's incredible when you when you actually see some of the care that went into this game. Uh, they took the logos of each of these series beautifully. You also have Cat Dog in there as well. Um, but when you go look, when you select which stage you want to race on, when you just want a, a single race, you select from the logo of the shows. And all the shows are beautifully done in like this 8-bit style. Um, so there was a lot of care that went in, but then when you see that mistake, it's like, how, how, did, the, how did this get passed? How did this get... Loaded onto the cartridge, and no one working on this game said, "Hey, you got the the Beavers' names wrong." <laughs> I, I don't know how many people were working on it, but uh, and I know that's information I can find out. I just don't want to dig into them that much. It was just funny out of seeing some of the care. Like when you start up the game, there's this beautiful sounding eight bit rendition of the Nickelodeon theme song. Um, for some reason, when you're on the when you're on the menus, the Rugrats theme plays. Although when you look into the company that made the Game Boy Color version, um, I I looked on their page. I forgot where I was, why I was on there, but they had made a lot of the handheld Rugrats games. Um, so that or it was, or at least um, through Hasbro Interactive. Uh, I don't know if it was them or uh, from Pipe Dream. But I looked, I was just like, I happened to be on the page and I'm like, oh, they, there was a lot of Rugrats games on there. So it made sense why the Rugrats theme was the most prominent in the Game Boy Color version. Um, look, I, like I said, I think most people would, would find the Game Boy Color version to be the most, to, to be the worst out of the bunch. I, I found a lot of love with it. Um, and it's something that I got to appreciate, um, playing it for so long. Somebody even said, I, I, I I honestly don't know if I can world record Nicktoons racing because it just seems to go on until you run out of time. I've tried two or three times since playing it on a uh, video Bob game pants over on Twitch, um, playing it on my own. And it, it, there doesn't seem to be an end. It just seems like you keep getting, if you keep getting gold, you just move on to another, another map, another track, and I don't think there is an end. Because when I looked up um, to see if there was any sort of information, like, does anybody have a world record on this game? Uh, it wasn't even listed on the website that I found that was like a speedrun website. Every other version of Nicktoons Racing was on there except for the Game Boy Color version. So I don't necessarily think there's an end to this game. Um, so other than it being top-down, there's actually not weapons you pick up traditionally in Mario Kart. While you're driving, there may be a power up on the on the course that eight eight out of ten times you don't even you can't it's impossible to miss because sometimes the track is just, it's thin. Um and some of these power ups they they're hard to distinguish from one another. But from what I could gather there's one that will make your cart go extremely fast. Uh, there is one that is a clear stop sign that when you when you collect that, every other cart is halted for like five solid seconds. Um, some of those came in, and there was no projectiles whatsoever. It was just seemed like it would either give your car a little bit of a boost or slow everyone down. Um, but yeah, there wasn't like traditional cart racing mechanics of you pick up a weapon and you can choose when to use it. It was just like, hey, if there happens to be on the road, pick it up. The levels themselves were very generic. So what uh, Pipe Dream did with this was they created backgrounds for Angry Beavers, Rugrats, the Wild Thornberries, uh, SpongeBob. And I don't think, I think Cat Dog was just a racer. I don't think there were any levels of Cat Dog. Um, but it was those four. And I can actually, this is weird. I have, uh, I have the emulator right here. So I can actually just load it up and see what's good. Um, yeah, so Hasbro Interactive. Uh, so they, they would make these generic looking backgrounds of each of the, of each of the series they're coming from. And they would have, I think it's six or seven different track types. 
So I don't know if you can hear that. So yeah, Rugrats, SpongeBob, Angry Beavers, Wild Thornberries. So yeah, just out of those four shows. Um, so you would select. Now I found this out. When you go into championship mode, you don't get to select this. It starts you at Angry Beavers. Then you play through Wild Thornberries. Then you play through SpongeBob and then Rugrats and then so on and so forth. So when you go to the tracks. So when you go to quick mode, you select, hey, which series do you want to race from? And then you get to pick the track. So let's see. One. Two, three, four, five. Six. Okay, so there's five different track types that you can choose from. Um, and then it just kind of overlays it, you know, the track over the the theme of the of the show. It's it's very simple. Um, but like I said, I, I can find the charm in that in that game. And I think it's if I if there was a scale out of ten, which I don't want to set this up where I have to rate every single game. Uh, maybe I'll keep track of this. Maybe I should. Um, I don't think that far that far ahead. If I could give any this game any sort of rating out of ten, I think I would give it a, a three or a four. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep that. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go with a three out of ten. It, it's that sounds bad, but let me just say that. I think the reason why I would even give it a four too is that it just it does have some charm. It's it's old, it doesn't age well, um, but I can see some of the effort put in here. It wasn't just slapped together. Although some people might look at this and say, "Yeah, it absolutely was slapped together." I, I think there was some care from from the people working on this, even though clearly Angry Beavers they were not as <laughs> they were not as. Uh, up to date on, if you will. Uh, I, I love some of the sprite work in the game with the with the characters. I mean, you got to remember this. These are very tiny screens, and you don't have much to work with. And they were able to get each of the characters kind of looking pretty decent on the track. Um, so I'm I'm just giving more credit where credits due uh, with this. the The next version of Nicktoons Racing that was released is the it was the PC version um, in 2000, and then was re released in 2001. Um, this was difficult, and I wasn't even planning on the PC version. I was planning on all home releases of Nicktoons Racing. Um, I have a PS3 that uh, I have one of the original models that was fully backwards compatible, and I have the adapter to be able to plug in my PS1 memory card. So I could play Nicktoons Racing on the PS1 on my PS3, which makes it incredibly easy to then use with a capture card the problem is that when i booted up the the nicktoons racing for ps1 it just looks terrible <laughs> now, now it's ps1 and when i've played this i usually don't use my ps3 for for the backwards compatible games because the more you use that the more it runs out that blu-ray drive I don't know if it's as expensive as it used to be to replace those drives on the inside of that system, but I try to use it sparingly. Um, so I have on my uh, on my desk, I have a uh, PS One, the the slim version with the add on screen. So when I want to play some PS One games, just like you know, quickly throw it in. I'll play it with the portable screen. Um, the game doesn't look half bad on a tiny screen that is about like the size of it, it, probably phones are bigger than this screen uh, these days. But when I blew it up on a on a bigger screen, I was like, this is it, it runs well, but it just looks bad. So I looked into finding uh, my my PC right now doesn't have a disk drive. So getting my pc version running i was like well let me see if there's a there's an iso out there and if I, there's any pc gamers out there you know all about isos and getting them working and thank goodness windows 10 can just mount isos just boom it does it um so i downloaded i found an iso of nicktoons racing on the pc and it it looks a lot better and i knew i have a pc that could run it um the only issue was at first the intro movie wouldn't play and there were certain textures that wouldn't show up like the windshield for the mystery rider was just transparent so you would see right through the car um 
certain like I'm, I think it was just anything that was supposed to be black and have have a shine to it just didn't show up. So I have tinkered with it for a, a day or two um, trying to get like the install right or what am I doing? Something with DirectX, what's going on? I eventually got it to where it would at least play the intro movie, which I wanted to have for the stream. Um, but those textures really didn't like when you were playing the game. I think it didn't use those textures. It was basically just cutscenes and menus. Those textures wouldn't show up. Um, I was like, what you know? I need this for one night, so I don't I don't mind that these textures are missing. And uh, so, if you've never played Nicktoons Racing, let me go into it a little bit. Now, this, by all accounts, this is like the main course. This is this is the main meal right here. This is a full 3D Mario Kart esque kart racer where you can pick from 13 different playable characters, including Tommy Pickles and Angelica Pickles from Rugrats, uh, Arnold and Helga from Hey Arnold, Eliza Thornberry and Darwin from The Wild Thornberries, uh, Norbert and Daggett from The Angry Beavers, Cat Dog from their show. SpongeBob and Patrick from SpongeBob SquarePants, Ickis from Ah Real Monsters, Stimpy from the Ren and Stimpy show, and of course the Mystery Rider, which we will get to in a second. Um, there obviously is a character behind that, but I don't want to spoil it for you right now. Um, other characters like Ren and Oblina, Ren from Ren and Stimpy, Oblina from Ah Real Monsters. Uh, they appear in the game's opening cutscene, but are actually not playable in the game and never show up at any other point. Uh, Squidward can be seen in the SpongeBob, one of the SpongeBob levels, and Rancid Rabbit from Cat Dog can also appear in one of the uh, Cat Dog levels. Um, this this has a lot of charm going with it, and it echoes a lot of what I was saying from the Game Boy Color version. There was a lot of effort put in for the Nicktoons brand. Um, do I think they got everything perfect to a T or a, as best as they could? Or let, let me, that's two different things. Do I think they got it perfect? No. Do I think they got it the best they could? Yes. Um, there's a lot of charm and a lot of effort that went into the decision on these levels, on the decision on the characters, on the decision of weapons that would be used. You know, bubbles from SpongeBob, cat litter from Ren and Stimpy. Uh, I'm trying to think of some others. Uh, you have Stump from the Angry Beavers being used as a weapon. I mean, this is clearly things you would need to watch the shows, and I'm sure the developers were shown a few episodes of each, each show just to kind of get an idea on the levels to build and the tracks and the weapons. Um, it, it's impressive on what they were able to do at the time. Do I think in certain areas there could be some improvements made? Absolutely. Um, the, the cart racing is not as tight as you would want it to be. It is very, I kind of want to use the word floaty. That, that's a word used more with platformers that if your character is a little bit more floaty than they should be, it's, it's not usually a good thing. And, and I kind of feel with the racing here, it's not, it's not as tight as it could be, which is crazy to think. And I'm going to bring this game up. Uh, it's not going to be in Video Bob Game Pants for years, but um, they're obviously a couple of years ago they did Nickelodeon Kart Racers uh, for for current systems, Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and they have Nickelodeon Kart Racers Two coming out later this year. And I bought Nickelodeon Kart Racers, and it's so it is such a weird bookend for for. Nicktoons Racing because there is a a racing series of games using the Nickelodeon characters. There's a history of this. It's not like they they haven't touched it for a couple years. Um, and so to go from this game to Nickelodeon Kart Racers, Nickelodeon Kart Racers has a very solid, very rudimentary level of of how the game is played if that makes sense um it's very tight racing the controls are concise it makes sense it feels good the problem 
is that in Nickelodeon Kart Racers, that game is devoid of character. Um, the the models look good, but the fact that there's no voice acting, there's not even really recognizable music. It doesn't feel like it's using the the license to its absolute fullest extent. And the so the like the one good thing is like okay, it's got a solid kart racing mechanic. It feels like it's a game, but. Going back to Nicktoons Racing, when the, the controls don't feel as solid, but there's just so much character going around you that I kind of would rather play this janky mess than I would Nickelodeon Kart Racers. It's crazy to think the, the frustrations I had with this game I would rather take because it, it's also exuding so much character that I would rather deal with subpar racing controls and mechanics than I would for one that's just completely devoid of character. Um, and it's funny because you have Tommy Pickles and you have Arnold and SpongeBob in both this Nicktoons racing game and Nickelodeon Kart Racers. Um, and it's just the, the cha Oh my God. It's, you're almost like 20 years later and it's like, what happened? Why? Why does this feel so boring? Um, which, side note, I'm glad to, I've seen the roster of Nickelodeon Kart Racers 2. I am glad to see that um, Game Mill is going deeper into the catalog of Nickelodeon characters to use. From all accounts, I think it's the most characters in a Nickelodeon Kart Racing game. Um I know voice acting can be expensive, but I don't think it would be expensive to take clips from the actual shows and just use that audio. P just do that. I I don't need to hear new audio from these voice actors, but to hear nothing again would be a little disappointing, but you're going in the right direction. Hopefully with Nickelodeon and Kart Racers 3, if that's a given, we can not only have an even more expansive kart racing roster but at least some sort of um, some audio from those shows would be would be super super nice. But um, they're on the right trajectory. I'll give them that. They're building off of their of their base, which was the first one. But anyway, back to Nicktoons Racing. So we have all these characters from the shows. Uh, almost e each show pretty much gets at least one level to kind of to kind of show off what it has uh, levels. You know, there's shows like Ah Real Monsters and Hey Arnold, which only gets and Ren and Stimpy only gets one, one track. Um, other shows like, like cat dog and Rugrats gets two. Um, and I have to say really some of the tracks really fun, really fun. I mean, the first track you play as, which is uh, I think it's a runaway runaway reptar, level uh it's almost like a carnival with with reptar and dactar it's it's very simple but it's enjoyable at the same time it feels iconic the first spongebob level is fairly enjoyable you go through jellyfish fields you're driving right through squidward's house um the first beavers level is fantastic but then you get levels like the ren and stimpy sh <laughs> the ren and stimpy level uh which it's inventive it feels crazy. It feels like it embodies what Ren and Stimpy represents. But, man, was it so frustrating. Uh, it goes through different locales of Ren and Stimpy. Ren and Stimpy was not a show that would always take place from the same, the same location. It goes through a neighborhood. And then it goes to uh, one of the planets that, that Ren and Stimpy were on in one of the space episodes. And then it goes to a really wacky area and then a military base. It's it's constantly changing. But that race took anyone who watched us. It took Alex and I like five or six tries to beat that level because and we were on easy mode. Mind you, uh, the rubber band effect in that game is horrendous. Um, if you were left back, you would have to work your buns off to get back up to first place. But, um, yeah, there was in some cases where certain characters would like you would they would be hit far back. And then out of nowhere, they would just they would just be right back up in your face. Um, but, yeah, that Ren and Stimpy level 
was was fairly tough. Uh, the the other one that really stood out was there was the there was two wild thornberries levels. The first one, fairly nice, uh, very very easy to understand level. Um, the second the second wild thornberries one had like two or three different paths you could take, and it was just not a fun mess because it was also one of the only levels that had big gaps you had to jump over, and the game sometimes would. Not like if you, I don't know, if you didn't jump in this right part of the, of the ramp, you wouldn't get to the higher part and even getting to the higher part, I don't think even helped you in the long run. So it was like high risk, low reward type situations. And that was a tough level that took a while, um, took a while to get through. Hey, Arnold's level was beautiful to say the least, um, going through the city and they would hide it where Anytime you were in tunnels, it would change the type of day. So you'd start out the daytime and then you get the nighttime. And it's beautifully designed. The thought process behind the level was beautiful, but it was a uh, it was a tough, also a tough level to get through. I think we had to do it a few times because that might have been in the cup, the same cup as uh, as that Wild Thornberries one. That caused us a lot because that was at the end, too. That was like one of the last. I think that was the last level. Which made it ten times more stressful because we're trying to beat the entire cup, and when everything comes down to that one level, it's it's super stressful. Um, at the end of the game, you find out that the mystery writer who brought all these Nicktoons together and put this whole this whole event together, because the winner of the event not only gets the Krabby uh, the Krusty Krab Big Bun Award, which is this really weird. Mr. Krabs looking trophy. They also got a lifetime supply of Krabby Patties. Well, the mystery writer is, you guessed it, Sheldon J. Plankton, who uh, uses clips from, from his episode uh, right at the end there for, for his voicing. But what's crazy about it is my uh, Alex didn't know that the mystery writer was Plankton, but while you're racing and you're hitting carts... The characters aren't really talking on their own. Um, you either have to... If you hit somebody with a weapon, your character usually will quip something. And when you get hit by a weapon, the character will quip something. Um, when you hit the mystery rider a few times uh, in in the racing, you will you can actually hear Plankton. So we weren't even done with the game, and uh, we had hit the mystery rider was hit with something. I think he ran into to a booger or slime, and um, Alex was like, "Oh, that's definitely plankton." And so I was like, "Oh man, I, I didn't confirm it at that point, even though he was one hundred percent right." I was like, "No," uh, I was like, "We'll see. Hey, uh, m- maybe, maybe it is." Um, so yeah, that's the mystery rider. Uh, I, I think that's really fun that given that this was SpongeBob's first uh, video game came, you know, w- within a year of of his launch that not only was SpongeBob and Patrick involved, the, the main the main win of the game was was SpongeBob based. The, the trophy was SpongeBob based. The prize was SpongeBob based and the villain of the game was Plankton. Thought that was very interesting. Um So, of course, this game got ported from the Windows version to the PS1 in 2001, uh, which, by all accounts, they are very much the same game with the same characters, same mechanics, same levels. It's it's all almost a one-to-one, one-to-one between the two, two areas there. The next game that was released is the Game Boy Advanced one, which was the last game we played uh, over the, over the uh, uh, Video Bob Game Pants. And the Game Boy Advance one, very much out of all three versions, and we both admit this, um, has the tightest controls, is the easiest to understand, and it plays a lot like... uh, I thought it played a lot like Mario Kart, uh, I think it's Super Circuit, which is the the Game Boy Advance game. Um, Alex brought up F-Zero Maximum Velocity. Both of those, I believe, were launch titles for the Game Boy Advance and maybe even built off of the same uh, system, kind of like Mario Kart being based off of the system for F-Zero, um, which makes sense. So, you know, it's it's 
it's still 2D sprites as far as the characters go. They they are made to look like 3D models. Um, and then you're kind of in this pseudo 3D, 2D track. Uh, the, you know, it adds a jumping mechanic to jump over pits and, and to get some extra air off of jumps. And it's a very simple game. You have weapons, you use the weapons, you got to get first place. And I think after going through so much with the 3D PC version, going to the Game Boy Advance one was a nice palate cleanser because from all accounts I can see online, the Game Boy Advance one has had the best review scores. Um, for example, the, the, the Game Boy Advance version was given an 8 out of 10 on IGN, which is in incredible to think about. An 8 out of 10. Um, that's that's an incredible score. Now, IGN, not the most consistent, but, they're, you know, they're still one of the well-known, uh, you know, well-known game reviewers out there on the web. So their their name still holds water. Uh, the community, as I can see on the uh, on the web archive, gave it a seven out of out of ten. There was three ratings. So the Game Boy Advance one really felt the best. Although with its limitations, it, it it can only be, you know, it was being held back. It only it can only be so good. Uh, the one thing I'll I'll give it is that it, it maintained pretty much all of the characters from the, the PC PS1 version. Um, everybody got levels to play in, and some of them were weird. Um, like having an entire track in the Rugrats house. Uh, I guess with the idea of everybody being baby sized, that that's fun. Now in the in the PC version, there was a track, the second Rugrats track, which took place um, going through like you'd go through Stu's workshop, and there was like the beginning part of it started in the Rugrats house, but then you would ride out into the street and then into like almost a sewer system, and then you're into Stu's lab. Um, I don't know. There was just something about the Game Boy Advance one. It had a it had some charm, but like even ideas like that, I was like, oh, that's weird. I, I get it, but it's just weird to think about like Tommy racing with all these characters in his house. Uh, even the idea of the Rugrats being characters, having Angelica in front of you and like you hitting her with like a missile or something or a bubble and just I was like, oh, that's weird. But but it's yeah, it's the Nicktoons. You got to ex accept it. Um, the one thing I wanted to have before recording this episode is I tried to reach out to a few developers of Nicktoons Racing because the one question I have out of all of this is that it seems like every Nicktoon from the beginning, Ren and Stimpy, all the way to SpongeBob and the Wild Thornberries, which were the newest Nicktoons of, of the time, all of them were included except... Obviously for Doug, because Disney owned Doug at that at, at this time. But there was not a sniff of Rocco. You you had every other base covered. You had Stimpy. You had Tommy and Angelica. You had Ickis from Auro Monsters. You have Arnold and Helga. You have Cat Dog. You have the Beavers. And then there's Wild Thornberries and SpongeBob. And Rocco was completely left out, even though, in my opinion, Rocco fits better racing with all these characters than someone like Eliza Thornberry does or even Arnold. Uh, it just seemed so weird. So I, I, I was trying to reach out to a few um, on Twitter and whatnot just to, to get an idea like, hey, was this a mandate from Nickelodeon? Like, or did you guys get to select this? Or did they come in and say, hey, you're only allowed to use these shows? Why did they exclude Rocco? Um that's the only thing I can think of is that if these developers had access to all these Nicktoons and they just left out Rocco, I think maybe Nickelodeon said don't use Rocco for whatever reason. That's the only thing that would make sense as to why he's not in there. It it wouldn't make sense as to why Nickelodeon wouldn't want him in there. But as far as like why the developers didn't use anything from Rocco's Modern Life, uh, it, it must have been a, a mandate from from Nick. Um, which leads up to the arcade version of the game, which was released in 2003. The biggest difference b 
between the PS1, the PC, the PS1, and the arcade version, other than the controls, is that the PC version actually, or uh, the the arcade version, actually doesn't include Stimpy the Cat. Um. The only thing I can think of, and this this makes sense, is the fact that in two, I believe it was two thousand three, in which the Ren and Stimpy show adult party cartoon aired on Spike TV. Which, for those that don't know, a little bit about uh, history here, um, I think it was yeah two thousand three, June twenty sixth. Uh, Spike TV was owned by Viacom. And it was branded at the time, like when it launched, it was a big push for adults. And then obviously, eventually it would get to like a big, it was the men channel. It was a men's channel. Um, but when they, when they started really with Spike TV, it was this real push for adult young males. And one of the things they were going after were a, adult cartoons. They were seeing the success of Comedy Central and what they were doing with South Park and the success of Beavis and Butthead. And they launched a a new animation block with three shows. Uh, Gary the Rat, Stripperella, which was actually co-created by Stan Lee. Um, and it was starring Pamela Anderson as a superhero. Uh, and then the the biggest push was a revival, an adult-oriented revival of the Ren and Stimpy show uh, called Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon. Now, this was, by all accounts, a disaster of a show. There were only six episodes of the show made, only three aired on television before it was taken off. Um, there is an entire episode or even podcasts worth of history with the Ren and Stimpy show. Um, but, and I don't want to get into a lot of the personal stuff, but there are clearly a lot of issues with one of the Ren and Stimpy creators, John Chris Felucci. To give the man credit where credit is due... John Chris Felucci is the man behind Ren and Stimpy. But the other man who was there to help with the production of the show was Bob Camp. He was co-founder and director for Spumco, which was the animation studio that, that created Ren and Stimpy. Um, and was an absolute major player with the studio until Creative Differences in 1992, which... Ren and Stimpy, for as popular as it was, was just taking so long to get out because of John Kay. John Kay wanted to take his time, wanted to, you know, he seems like the kind of guy that, that even if it took five years to get one piece of animation out, he, he would be so proud knowing that a lot of effort went into that one animation. And Nickelodeon, you know. Wanted to get the steam rolling on this show. It was popular. They needed episodes out. And he was constantly late. And he was actually fired. Um, and production of Ren and Stimpy went from Spumco to Games Productions, which would also be known as Games Animation, which would eventually become the Nickelodeon Animation Studio. Uh, Bob Camp was, was moved from Spumco and he left to go work for games to help continue Ren and Stimpy. And then he was promoted to the creative director um, and, and helped supervise every other episode that was made until it ended in fully like completed done 1995. Um, so there's a little history for you. So, but John Kay was the the guy that was really behind a lot of those gross, mature moments of Ren and Stimpy. So Viacom pushing this new network, making a new animation block decides, you know what? Let's revive Ren and Stimpy. Let's let's do a reboot, a revival of it. 
and we'll bring back the original creator and let him like take take the chains off take take the the leash off the dog and let him run free let's see what he does and he creates Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon which look shows like Ren and Stimpy and Rocco did well with barriers the mature humor that they were able to squeeze through it wasn't sometimes it was on the nose but sometimes they had to be really creative in what they got through censors and what aired on television that's a part of the fun if you just take the barriers down and you let them do whatever they want it's not as fun when you're just making really mature and crude humor for the sake of doing it when you have to be creative to find ways to hide it that's that's what we can appreciate as adults is that we can watch a kid's show and see the see the words between the lines. Why, like, oh, man, that was an adult joke. And it went over the heads of, of kids. And then when you when you're a kid watching those and you can grow up and see those moments again, it makes you appreciate it on a whole new level. So when you take John Kay and you let him go, OK, go, be as mature as you like with this. Do what you want. We're not going to censor anything. It makes for a bad show. It does not make Ren and Stimpy Ren and Stimpy. It makes it worse, in my opinion. This is, of course, my opinion. Um, so I can imagine that with the arcade launch of Nicktoons Racing, they wanted to push away Ren and Stimpy as a as a series. I, I can't tell you if, uh, if they're their level is in there um which by the way i i have these the level names with me uh so um yeah so i i, I don't know if the if the the ren and stimpy level is still in the P, uh, the arcade version i think it is i think that's just kind of like a wink to the series but yeah stimpy was completely ripped away from the arcade version but anyway just to go through the levels that we have here um cup one is uh the reptar raceway the Dam Prix from Angry Beavers, or the Rancid Raceway, which is going through uh, the mall and cat dog, and then we have Bikini Bikini Bottom Blowout. Uh, Cup two is Race Madness, which is the uh, the Ren and Stimpy level may, uh, named after Space Madness, one of the uh, episodes. Next we have Beaver Fever, another Angry Beavers level with a with a seventies disco theme. Uh, then we have the Nearberg Rally, one of my favorite levels. Um, it, it's based off a of cat dog, but you get this beautiful rendition of cat dog's house in 3d and, um, a few other locales from the show. And it, and it feels like it was, it was done very well. Uh, next we have the first, um, wild thornberries level safari speedway. The one that I like, uh, cup three monster mania, which is based off of all real monsters, the pickles parkway, the gritty city circuit, which is, it, it, it sounds like gritty kitty. Uh, which is the cat litter from Ren and Stimpy, but the Gritty City Circuit is actually the Hey Arnold level. Uh, and then Bongo Bang Up, which is, like I said earlier, the most frustrating. Um, th there's a few differences. The GBA version has uh, Mrs. Puff's Driving School, uh, Real Racing, uh, Reptar Raceway, Jazz Mataz. Uh, they have Race Madness again, Bikini Bottom Blowout, Safari Speedway, Beaver Fever, and then Nearberg Rally, Gritty City Circuit, Pickles Parkway, Congo Bongo, Bang Up. Uh, so it's a, a lot of the same level ideas, but the, the tracks themselves are different in the Game Boy Advance version. So now, laying everything out there, that is the the entire series of Nicktoons Racing. Um, of course, the, the series I started really is mainly about SpongeBob. Um, I, I would love to one day... Uh, kind of do this similar idea in, in podcast form of every Nickelodeon game. Because even before this, you have all of the 8-bit uh, and 16-bit Ren and Stimpy games. You have Rocco's Modern Life on the Super Nintendo, the All Real Monsters game, um, the, the, the countless Rugrats games that have come out. I would like to, to eventually expand this idea. But for SpongeBob's first playable video game appearance. I think his first video game appearance in general. 
like I said, other than if there was like a flash game on the website, that that's the one thing I'm not a hundred percent sure of. But I, I do think he didn't appear in any other video game, and certainly for consoles, this is his first one. It, it's not a bad debut. I think it's nice to have him in there with all the Nicktoons because it kind of cements his his place in Nicktoons. Um, he wasn't left out like like Rocco was. Uh, and he certainly fits well. His world and his character design fits well with a lot of those goofier Nicktoons. Like when you put him there with Stimpy and Ickis and Cat Dog and the Beavers, he just naturally fits. Some of those human characters fit too, just because we know them. We associate them with Nickelodeon, like Tommy and and uh, and Arnold. I think Eliza Thornberry is the one that really sticks out like a sore thumb. But I'm glad she's a part of it. And I, you know, she's she's a Nicktoon. Love her to death. Um, I, I had a lot of fun with all three versions of this game. If I could recommend one version for you guys to play, it would be the main version. Um, if you get it on PS1, which don't shy away from the PS1 version because I said the graphics weren't as good as the PC version. It plays fine. That's what matters is that the same driving racing experience you were going to have on pc or in the arcade is going to be the same you're going to have on ps1 it's just limited in how much it can show you in graphics so don't shy away from that if you have a ps1 or a ps2 available by all means buy that game play it enjoy it um it's certainly not the best version of the three the best best version of the three is the game boy advance version it feels um like it, it, it got everything down. It's got a good racing mechanic. It feels good. It feels complete. It, because it's limited, it can only give you so much character in terms of what the levels look like and the weapons and the voices. Um, so, but that's why I would give you the version that I think, hey, the racing might not be the best, but that, that character, that level of, um, devotion to the Nickelodeon brand to each of the shows is on full force in that main version in that 3d arcade ps1 pc version and that's why i would recommend for most people to play that one um if you ever see that arcade machine by all means play it send send me the picture tell me what you think about it i, I would love to know what your thoughts are um i i shy away from downloading ROMs of games I don't already own, but by all means, there are websites out there that have built-in emulators that'll let you play games right on the website. You don't have to download anything. Go and try out the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance version. It can't hurt. You don't have to pay a dime. Um, if you can find physical cartridges of these, my goodness, they're inexpensive. Pick them up. They're nice to have as part of your collection. And I think it was a it was a solid it was a goofy but solid start in this series, because as we're going on, we're going to be hitting some some real big speed bumps before we start getting to some really good SpongeBob games. Uh, and this isn't just about the Nickelodeon stuff. Of course, we have you know, like Nicktoon Party Blast and Nicktoons Unite, where SpongeBob is playable. But um, I, I enjoy this. If I could rate, I rated uh, the Game Boy Color version a three out of ten. Uh, I will do this. I am going to say that I'm going to agree with IGN. Uh, I'm going to actually agree with the users. I think the Game Boy Advance version of Nicktoons Racing is a 7 out of 10. And I think the... Um, where am I going to rate these? I'm going to, I'm going to chunk together the PS1, PC, and arcade versions. Um, even though I want to ding the arcade version for its lack of Stimpy, which I completely understand why. Uh, it's controls. That arcade machine feels great. Um, sitting in the big orange chair, having the gas, having a button for the weapons. It feels it feels right. Um, so that's why I'm going to give those versions, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. A solid in the middle, like not bad, but not extraordinary. But what really sets it apart, and the only reason I would, I would consider it giving a 6 out of 10, is I think it does the Nickelodeon brand, the Nicktoons brand right. I think there was a lot of care that went into those levels. There was a lot of thought uh, what they should do, what kind of levels, what should be in the levels. There's some deep cut references in there. Uh, and I, I think they hit it. They hit the nail on the head with that game. I think it was a wonderful, wonderful job 
Um, obviously, software creations deserves a lot of credit there. Um, and then, you know, the publisher being Hasbro Interactive knew what they were doing uh, with this series. And it kept it, you know, you had a game that was released in 2000 and all the way in 2003, you had new versions of it coming out. So, and this is clearly the start of a long history with with the Nicktoons in racing games. And, and more of them we will be playing as because there's more games uh, in the in the Nicktoons racing series. So please uh, follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Spongebob podcast. Uh, the next video, Bob Game Pants, will be a couple months down the road. But, you know, in the meantime, I am streaming other other Nickelodeon games, other video games in general. And if there's anything that you guys want to see me play, I, I haven't gotten any requests, but I guarantee you the first, like, 25 requests I get I'll absolutely play whatever games you want me to stream whether or not be an old school Nickelodeon game something newer uh, even doesn't even have to be a Nickelodeon game Cartoon Network Racing on the PS2 I'll whip that out and I'll play that for you guys um, just let me know any any feedback is appreciated um, so thank you for listening to the show uh, very very appreciated thank you for uh, Christian Vasquez for that uh, for that Spongebob intro and we'll see you guys next time on another episode of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast.